Hello, I'm Michelle Powers, and you are watching a special edition of Currents News. It was a rallying cry at protests across the country, and now many lawmakers are trying to make it a reality. Defund the police, who supports it, and what it could look like. Those calls come as summer violence flares up in big cities, exploding in Chicago. It's deadliest day in decades. We'll take a look. George Floyd has been laid to rest, but the spot in Minneapolis where he died is now hallowed ground for many. And the Big Apple is reawakening from lockdown, but for some, it's too late. Meet a small business owner who is determined to recover. Bill, he'll have to go at it alone. He says the government is no help. Plus, a woman of faith who works three jobs. She's also a single mother and a Catholic college's valedictorian. That's all ahead of you on Currents News Special Edition. There are growing calls across the country for drastic action directed against police. In Minneapolis, where George Floyd died at the hands of an officer, there's a move to abolish the force entirely. More on that in a moment. Right now, we begin in New York with Currents News' Emily Druby. For the first time, the mayor is vowing to cut funding. Mayor Bill de Blasio is planning on cutting the NYPD's budget in response to demands from protesters for change. People did not protest for the sake of protest. They protest to achieve change, and now we must deliver that change. On Sunday, the mayor talked about moving money from the NYPD and using it for social and youth services. We are committed to shifting resources uh, to ensure that the focus is on our young people. Calls to defund or even abolish the police have become top demands among protesters throughout the country, including here in New York City. When more funding is put into, you know, policing, then it is education, then housing, um, social services, you know, it's an issue. It shows that there's an imbalance. The head of the NYPD's detective union, Paul DiGiacomo, is warning that slashing the police budget will have consequences. If you cut the funding from the New York City Police Department, the only people that will suffer are the people of this city. The detective is also taking aim at politicians he accuses of not supporting the cops. It's not fair to the members of the NYPD and my detectives that are out there putting their lives on the line. Uh, if you assault one of my detectives, we will go after you with civil litigation. That is a promise. We are done being abused. Former police officer and current criminal justice professor Peter Moskos adds any funding cut will almost definitely mean less cops. You can't easily cut a organization that where, where 80 plus percent of the funding goes goes to labor costs. So at least we should be honest about what is being proposed. Some are talking about stripping a billion dollars out of the NYPD's six billion dollar budget. De Blasio doesn't have a number yet, but insists it won't be a billion. While doing that, we will only do it in a way that we are certain continues to ensure that this city will be safe. In Albany this week, the Democrat-led legislature is being expected to pass a slew of bills that address police practices. One hot-button measure would end secrecy surrounding the discipline records of cops. It's known as 50A, and abolishing it is something else that protesters are demanding. In Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Emily Druby, Currents News. And Albany lawmakers are approving that package of laws targeting police misconduct. The measures range from a ban on the use of chokeholds to scrapping a statute that had kept disciplinary records of police secret. With Democrats now controlling the full state legislature, proposals that got nowhere for years are being approved in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. Governor Andrew Cuomo is saying he will sign the bills into law. The new measures come as police in New York City are confronting a crime wave. Murders and shootings in the Big Apple skyrocketed last week compared to a year ago. There were 13 killings versus five in the same period of time in 2019. The cops reported 40 shootings, the most in a week since 2015. And from up from 24 a year ago in just one night, eight people were injured in four separate shootings in Brooklyn. Those spikes in violence aren't just limited to New York City. Violence in Chicago has hit a mark never seen before, 18 murders in one day. The killings on Sunday, May 31st, made it the deadliest day since the city's crime lab started keeping records in 1961. 
Some of the dead included a working father, a high school student, and a college freshman who had hoped to become a corrections officer. Over the entire weekend, 25 people were killed and another 85 wounded by gunfire. Top official at the crime lab said he doubt, doesn't know how to put the violence in context because it was unlike anything he's ever seen before. In Minneapolis, city council members are, quote, beginning the process of ending the police department. Go home, Jacob! Go home! Go home, Jacob! Go home! Their words, which came one day after this incident, Mayor Jacob Frey told a crowd of protesters he does not support the full abolishment of the MPD, set off a long, complicated debate about the future of the police force. This week, Lisa Bender, the Minneapolis City Council president, was asked what a family should do in the middle of the night if an intruder invades their home and there's no police department to call. Yes, I mean, I, I hear that loud and clear from a lot of my neighbors. And I know, and, and myself too, and I know that that comes from a place of privilege because for those of us for whom the system is working, I think we need to step back and imagine what it would feel like to already live in that reality where calling the police may mean more harm is done. Bender admits defunding the police department wouldn't happen immediately. She says it would take years before police would not be necessary. Meanwhile, the spot in Minneapolis where George Floyd died has become hallowed ground for many. Hundreds have traveled there from across the country to be part of something they hope signals change. Flowers now cover the ground where George Floyd took his last breath. A moment of silence held to remember the man whose life was taken by police and sparked an uprising around the globe. It's not just a spectacle. It's something where you come here, you pay your respects, you understand it's a place to learn, it's a place to see what, what happened and, and honor that and learn how to move forward. For Juliana Naza, her trip from Brooklyn to this site was more emotional than expected and it has caused her to call for change. Getting police reform, um, you know, spending money in different places, I think that um, the louder we are, the more things will change. We need to make sure we keep the pressure on, we need to make sure that we stay out here, that the energy stays the same. Community organizer Michael McDowell says the wheels of change are moving. He believes Minneapolis is the epicenter of the uprising and will be the city where a different type of policing will become reality. A lot of folks are trying to adjust to how fast the change we want is actually happening. What's happening on this site is a connection with community like never before. While I'm standing here taking this all in, our generation and our children's generation, the world could give change. You guys are going to see this in textbooks and in history, and this is something you need to see. So a teaching moment on the last day of school and our 18th wedding anniversary. For Dan and Beth Rodich, this gathering of people from all different backgrounds gives them hope that together we can force change. I hope one day we can all sit around a, a table somewhere and have a great conversation and look back at today and go, we made a difference. That's really what I hope. Christine Persichetti, Currents News. The leader of the Diocese of Brooklyn, Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, delivered a powerful homily this week on the evil of racism. Racism is a learned behavior. People are not born racist. Yes, it's picked up by attitudes and feelings and words. Only when we find the love of God and bring that love to others will things change. For the salvation of our nation and the salvation of mankind, we must follow another way. This does not mean that we abandon our righteous efforts, but we shall not in the process relinquish our privilege and obligation to love. This is the only way to create beloved communities. Bishop DiMarzio established the Commission on Racism and Social Justice in the Brooklyn Diocese two years ago. One result from the panel's work, Catholic school teachers are teaching lessons to prevent the seeds of the sin from growing. Parishes in the Diocese of Brooklyn are also working on that, rallying to overcome the sin of racism. Many are organizing focus groups in an effort to reach out to their communities. Current News' Jessica Easthope introduces us to a member who just joined the Catholic Church, but he says racism is anything but new. The Catholic Church is sending a strong message against racism. In the Diocese of Brooklyn, 
The sin is being fought off with love. If the church loves and encourages other to love each other, then we deal with the basic issue. Father Bill Smith, the pastor of St. Charles Borromeo in Brooklyn Heights, is leading by example, encouraging his parishioners to address racism by talking about their experiences. We become human by community and by building up and strengthening relationships. Who else can do that but the church? We have this obligation to, to pray for our community and our country and our world. And Recently following a Zoom prayer service, parishioners listened to the experiences of one of their own. I respect the police and everything, but I would be lying to you if I've had interactions with the police where I knew if my skin color was different, it would not happen. Tevin Williams is a new Catholic and a new New Yorker. He was confirmed last year and recently put down roots in the city after leaving the South. The loving piece, right, of me being a Catholic and, and talking and having these conversations with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, um, that is something I cannot say I've really seen in the South. Tevin says thanks to his parish community, he's better able to cope with the racial unrest sweeping the nation. I'm thankful that I am a Catholic right now. It is God's will that I'm here in this parish and having these conversations and enlightening some people and telling them my experience. Tevin said Father Bill is the kind of leader every parish needs, allowing for a safe space to discuss hard truths about race and overcome each other's differences. I hope that we can come together as Catholics and understand um, that we may be different in skin tone, but we are all bound by one heart. But we also understand the reality. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. There's a lot more news headed your way. More conflict in America. This one in the papers. We are all entitled to our own opinion, aren't we? But are some more fit to print than others? We're taking a look at the New York Times and their recent backlash after a controversial op-ed. Plus, thousands of small businesses in New York City have closed and others are just barely hanging on. One owner who says he's going to be going at it alone no guidance from the government. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. It's been a rough week for the gray lady. The New York Times lost a top editor after the paper received backlash over an opinion piece penned by Senator Tom Cotton. Should the editor have left? We're told everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but are journalists choosing what's fit for print? Current News' Christine Persichetti sat down with St. John's University professor and journalism expert Mike Rizzo. Here he is with the answers to some of those questions. The New York Times has control over who its personnel are, um, who works for them, and what they feel should be the right people in that position. Um, the concern that I have related to journalism is that um, there was, as you mentioned, backlash. And there was backlash because people felt that this op-ed should not have been in the Times in the first place. And the Times has control over the content that it has. And that's good. That allows for a free press. No one telling a newspaper or a news organization what it should put out. But the role of the op-ed, and op-ed, by the way, stands for opposite editorial. Hmm. And opposite is not just geographic, usually opposite the page of the editorial writing, but it's opposite a lot of times in, in opinion and, and thinking. And in fact, when the New York Times started um, its op-ed page in 1970, it talked about welcoming divergent views. They wanted to have people with no connection to the Times who would offer different opinions. So the Times has the right to do what it wants with its personnel, but we should be in a position because there is a long tradition of people trying to espouse different opinions when news comes up and we should be able to be open to listening to those positions. So that's the whole thing. I mean, this is an opinion piece. So are those columns treated differently than regular news columns? Are they still copy edited? What's, you know, the Times responsibility with that? Yes, those are checked. Those are uh, looked at so that uh, something that is egregiously wrong, um, something that really espouses violence um, or 
professes something that really is, again, outrageous and not based on, you know, you know what people can think is the fact, and I don't want to make that seem like it's not factual, but it's, again, opinion. So those are checked. And in this case, there are differing opinions from Senator Cotton as to what was checked and from the Times as to uh, what was checked. But they are, uh, they're not journalism, because journalism should be factual stories based on what happened. These are people's opinions. All right. So first, Bennett defended the opinion piece, then said it was wrong to run it. He actually admitted he didn't even read it before it ran online. Did the Times fail in their publishing standards here? Well, that's the issue that I think the Times has to address. If they have standards, like any good newspaper should have standards, any good news organization should have standards, and they fail to follow that standard, that's an internal matter that, again, they should address. It will. They should explain to people what they are addressing, and they've started to do that. And that transparency will help news consumers know that the Times is doing its best to present not only news reporting, but also opinion and editorial pieces that really are well thought out and uh, properly researched. But why is this happening now? It's not the first time the Times has run a controversial opinion piece. As a matter of fact, in 2014, a column ran titled, Pedophilia, a Disorder, Not a Crime. No one resigned after that, so why mm -hmm. now? We're in an emotionally charged time, and that's the concern as well. We can easily get into silos, and I've presented on this. We need a diversity, not just of people of different demographics, ethnicities in our newsrooms. We need the ability for folks to be able to speak their opinions. Now, Tom Cotton doesn't work for The New York Times, but he was offered or at least allowed to present a column with a completely different view than most of what the editorial positions of The Times are. So given that opportunity, the Times then posted a number of columns rebuking what he said. If you look at the uh, piece online, there's almost 2,400 comments. Those mm -hmm. are the modern day letters to the editor. Let people hear, read what people have to say that may not agree with what they have to say, and then comment on it. But to now potentially shut it down, you run the risk of people not, again, opening their minds to other people's thoughts. That was Mike Rizzo from St. John's University. New York's economy is still struggling to get back on its feet. The partial reopening of some places this week should be helping, but in too many cases, small businesses are still being crushed. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has the story of an owner who says he's being left in the dark to fend for himself. The front door of your man's pub in Glendale has been locked for months, and its employees locked out, jobless. It was very emotional. With tears in his eyes, owner Jimmy O'Reilly says it's been torture. We need to open the backbone of New York and the backbone of America. We work too hard to go down. We're not, I'm not going down. I got a loan to keep going and I know I can come back. Your man's is one of the millions of small businesses in New York City that temporarily closed due to COVID-19. According to the governor's office, it's projected more than 100,000 will never open again. Jimmy is losing money by the hour. I do 600,000 a year, maybe more. The last three months, I probably took in 10,000. Like many other businesses, your man's closed its doors on March 15th, not knowing when he would open them again. And nearly 90 days later, he still doesn't know. Jimmy says he hasn't been given any guidance from the government. We need to open. We have to open and our officials are not giving us any timeline of when, how, anything, nothing. They're giving us nothing. Guidelines, nothing. Not only is your man's ready to reopen, it's ready to do it safely. This is one of the many safety precautions Jimmy and his staff have been working on to make social distancing inside the bar possible. Is marine quality plastic? Jimmy has redesigned his entire bar in an effort to make customers feel safe. His livelihood depends on it. That if two people sit here or one person and they don't know this person, no problem. He's thought of every possible way people could come in contact with each other and built a solution. All it is is a coat stand, roll around. You can put anywhere you want. Family here, family there. Obviously, they have to come in at their own risk. 
but I will do my utmost best to keep it sanitary, keep it clean, keep it that they're safe. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Still to come on Currents News, a force to be reckoned with, a triple threat. One mother, student, and employee had her eyes on the prize. It's a big one with even bigger opportunities. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at thesalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number, 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. hard to concentrate on just about anything these last couple of months. But imagine this scenario, raising a child, working three jobs, and finishing college. Not just finishing it, but acing it. All through a pandemic and social unrest the country hasn't seen in decades. Seems impossible, no? Not quite. Current News' Emily Druby introduces us to a woman who did it all. Alexa Rutkowska almost didn't go to college. It was only a short time ago. Now, she's at the top of her class. Alexa is one of two valedictorians at St. Francis College, and she's practicing the speech she's going to give to the graduates. Over the last four years here at St. Francis College, we have learned a lot. Alexa achieved her academic accolades while successfully handling her most important job, being a single mom. I was waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning, going to work for 6 a.m. I was a barista. Then I would shoot right over to school, have class after class, participate in extracurriculars. It was a lot. I had 16-hour days, and I'd, at the end of the day, I'd have to come home take care of my daughter, so it was a lot. A lot indeed. In addition to her full-time barista job, the Brooklyn native was a tutor, had an internship, and worked as a teaching and research assistant, all while still taking care of her daughter. A packed schedule. Alexa didn't just persevere, she excelled, maintaining a 4.0 grade average. Now she's graduating with a master's degree in psychology. I just have to dedicate it all to hard work and perseverance and not letting anything get in my way. Even though I would have to not sleep some nights, I would just put those extra hours in. Alexa is Catholic and calls St. Francis Xavier in Park Slope her home parish. She says getting this top honor took a lot of persistence, organization, and really good planning. But nothing could stop her. She says anyone can achieve their dreams. Avoid the naysayers because there's going to be people telling you that you can't do it and it's too much, but with the right support and your perseverance and the tenacity, you'll be able to accomplish anything. I mean, look at this. Up next for Alexa, she's applying for doctorate work in clinical psychology. She hopes to one day work in private practice. In Brooklyn Heights, Emily Druby, Currents News. Wow, what a feat. And that is Currents News. I'm Michelle Powers. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Be sure to join Christine Persichetti every weeknight at 7. I hope you have a great weekend.